Welcome everyone. I am Palak Sharma and as usual, a very, very warm welcome to all of you once again to the Global Public Policy Program 2021. So this program is hosted by Center for Policy Studies at J.K. Lakshmipath University in collaboration with the School of Public Policy at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. For today's session, we have two very, very impressive academicians with us who are going to talk about two very relevant themes. The first one being, how can cities be made more resilient for climate change? And the second one being, water and wheels, the role of nonprofits in policy. I am the program manager for the LSEF UMass Scholarship Program at J.K. Lakshmipath University, which selects a cohort of young, dynamic, and exceptional students every year, offering them a generous amount of scholarship to pursue a master's in public policy, resource economics, or data analytics and computational social science with first year at J.K. Lakshmipath University and the second year at UMass Amherst. The lectures today are a part of the five uh, par packed and interactive session series that's going on between both the universities by some of the most inspiring and accomplished faculty members and public policy specialists and professionals from UMass Amherst. I would now like to introduce the speakers for today's session. For today's session, the first speaker that we have with us is Professor Thedis Miller. He's an associate professor at the School of Public Policy and professor's work focuses on interdisciplinary research collaborations and research community partnerships to advance urban sustainability and resilience from the local level to the international level. Professor Miller serves on the leadership team of a five year dollar 12 million National Science Foundation funded urban resilience to extremes sustainability research network project. It aims to engage with nine cities in the US and Latin America to advance research policy and practice on resilience in the face of climate change. Professor Miller is also engaged in projects on the municipal and regional level, partnering with local governments in both Portland, Oregon, and Phoenix area on issues related to resilience, equity, sustainability, and emerging technology. Professor Miller is the author of Reconstructing Sustainability Science, Knowledge and Action for a Sustainable Future, which examines how the emerging field can be used to advance positive action. He has published articles in journals, including Urban Studies, Science as Culture, Sustainability Science, uh, and Issues in Science and Technology. And his research has been funded by federal, regional, and industry partners. Professor Miller also publishes regularly in general audience outlets, including Slate and The Conversation on Technology, Governance, and Sustainability Issues. Prior to joining UMass, Professor Miller was Associate Professor at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the Polytechnic School of Arizona State University, where he was also the co-director of the Center for Smart Cities and Regions. Before that, Professor Miller was an Assistant Professor at the Tulin School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. Professor Miller received his PhD from Arizona State School of Sustainability and MPA in Environmental Science and Policy from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs and a BA in Economics and Environmental Studies from the Bucknell University. We are very glad to have Professor Miller amongst us today to enlighten us about climate change and how urban cities have become more resilient to it. We would also like to introduce the second amazing speaker that we have today, Professor Juniper Katz. Professor Katz is an assistant professor in the School of Public Policy. Professor Katz holds a PhD from University of Colorado Denver School of Public Affairs with her thesis impressively titled The Effect of Policy Implementation on Public Values, which also happened to receive the best dissertation award for 2019-20. Professor Katz has an MS in Resource Management and Administration from Antioch University in New England. Her research interests include environmental policy, policy process, new public governance, and nonprofit management. Her research focuses on how policy and implementation jointly constitute public values among citizens and nonprofits interacting with government. She has published in journals including the Review of Policy Research and the Journal of Environmental Policy and Planning. Prior to joining UMass, Professor Katz was an executive director of a land trust in Colorado. 
and a program manager and land protection fellow at the non-profit Colorado Open Lands. In those roles, she raised more than $5 million and led the protection of 49,000 acres of land and habitat across the state. She has also served as a data analysis consultant for the Land Trust Alliance in Washington, D.C. And we are very, very glad to welcome both these amazing academicians amongst us today. I would now request uh, all the audience to note this, that you can post your questions in the chat box. Please mention that for whom is the question directed. We would take the question at the end of the entire talk, or we might also choose to do it right after the session of one speaker is over in case there are a lot of questions. So please put it out in the Q&A section and we'll be picking up your questions at the discretion of the speaker and they'll be answered as per the availability of time. I now request Professor Thedas to begin with this session and speak about his uh, topic today. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you for the warm welcome, especially on a snowy day here in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to be here. I wish I could see everybody there. And we, this, it, you know, it's nice to have the virtual uh, way to get together and give this talk that might not otherwise have been given, but uh, also miss seeing faces and meeting new people. Um, so hopefully in, a, in another time. Um, so I've put together a few slides to talk a bit about some of the work we're doing on um, urban resilience uh, and resilience uh, policy and planning. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, to, to primarily talk about some of the work I've been doing um, with a, a large group of faculty and graduate students and postdocs and community members and practitioners uh, through this uh, Urban Resilience to Extremes uh, Sustainability Research Network, or the UREX SRN, uh, funded by the US uh, National Science Foundation. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that's structured and how that works. Um, uh, but, uh, but for today, I'll go through what I think are some of the you know, more exciting and impactful uh, themes that we've been trying to uh, construct and advance uh, for thinking about resilience or you know, in the broadest way possible, thinking about how is it that that communities uh, can be prepared for uh, extreme events, you know, whether that be something uh, like flooding or extreme heat, you know, or obviously, you know, I think we missed in our own project, we missed the um, thinking about public health and, and coronavirus and, and COVID. Um, but I think that's, um, you know, going to lead to a lot of additional work on, on urban resilience. Uh, which has been gaining traction uh, in the U.S. context uh, for the past, uh, you know, five or eight years or so, um, as as cities try to grapple uh, with some of the emerging impacts of of climate change, um, and so I'll, I'll, we're starting to frame it with, within this idea of the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene um, is uh, the idea that we live on a human-dominated planet, and and humans uh, are the ones that are now responsible for uh, many of the trends and dynamics that we see in our Earth systems or in our ecological systems. Uh, whether that's something from you know uh, habitat habitat degradation to you know carbon dioxide increase, um, and that the Anthropocene is is characterized by not only kind of accelerating trends uh, in, in earth systems, but also accelerating socioeconomic trends due to social changes, uh, many of which interact with those ecological changes, as well as technological changes, right? Which, which also interact with both the social um, and ecological changes. And the Anthropocene, I think why it's important to, to bring up uh, just quickly for this purpose, is characterized by you know, increasing uncertainty uh, among you know, how these trends are working and what their impacts will be, increasing complexity in terms of how they uh, interact with each other and how those uh, trends interact with our governance regimes uh, or, our, uh, or our infrastructure systems or even our social systems, um, and that they are accelerating. So the speed you know, with which these occur is also important. Um, because um, uh, it's, it's a challenge for our organizations as well as our built systems uh, to adapt quickly enough uh, to this new world. Um, and I think for, for the purpose of this talk, I'll be focusing on uh, resilience and infrastructure uh, because I think where we see this acceleration kind of separating uh, from the ability of our built and organizational systems to, to deal with these trends and to deal with some of the elements of the Anthropocene uh, are in infrastructure, and I'll just you know infrastructure are those 
uh, social and technological systems that essentially deliver the services that make modern life possible. Um, and, and here on the screen, you just see a, a few examples from the US context of where we're seeing the, uh, the impacts of, of these accelerating trends on our infrastructure. Uh, so in the top left, uh, you have the recent deep freeze um, in Texas, which left millions uh, without power, um, and led to the essential, you know, the rolling blackouts and the collapse of the, of the Texas grid um, due to extreme cold. Uh, in the top middle there, you have this past summer's California wildfires, which were actually caused from an interaction uh, between wildlands um, and the, uh, the electric grid. Uh, the top right, uh, you have uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey, which uh, flooded uh, the Houston area and, and Texas uh, a few years ago. Uh, in the bottom left, you have, you know, just representing extreme heat in, in Phoenix, Arizona. It's in the desert, a place that's used to heat, uh, but they're seeing record number of days every year over 110 degrees um, and even over 120 degrees rising. And so, you know, it becomes a question about the long term, not just resilience, but sustainability of that region. Um, and then on the bottom right, uh, you have one of the initial wake up calls, at least for the US context, um, and that's the flooding of a, of a subway entryway there um, in, in New York City as a result of, of Superstorm San Sandy. Um, and so, so I think it's important to, as we think about these infrastructure systems, I think typically we think of them as just like built things, uh, technological systems, um, and it's just a issue of building better uh, uh, built systems. Um, but the way we're looking at it through this project and, and through over our work on this um, is not just as the built systems, but as connected built systems or technological systems, as well as social and ecological systems. And just quickly here, this is the Central Arizona Phoenix Canal, uh, which delivers water from the Colorado River uh, in, into Phoenix. Um, and so a real lifeline uh, for, for that community. Um, and so, yeah, so the infrastructure is not just the built hardware, it's the institutional rules and norms uh, that determine uh, what we design for, how we maintain and manage that infrastructure, the social norms and expectations about what services we ought to get and how reliable they ought to be and how they should be delivered, as well as the ecological systems that interact with that infrastructure in some way, or increasingly, are you know, ecological systems being designed into infrastructure. So here, you know, you basically are linking the, the Colorado River watershed, an ecological system with the technological system of this canal, or you know, in more mundane ways, uh, certainly in the US context, you have the rise of green infrastructure or kind of building in uh, wetlands and, uh, and other ways of, of managing stormwater um, in, in cities. And so the, the way we're trying to, and typically, you know, the, the, the infrastructure is designed, I'll talk a bit, little bit about this uh, in, a, in a few minutes, um, but on the ideas of, of, you know, focusing on a narrow set of services that are supposed to be controlled. And, and we're trying to advance this um, way of thinking about resilience and thinking about infrastructure resilient as um, interdependent or linked social, ecological and technological systems. Um, because typically an infrastructure organization might just look at the, you know, ecological flows and how to, how to control that uh, via, via technological uh, uh, um, interventions. Um, but we're saying that, that in fact, these systems are, are complex and linking across social, ecological and, and technological systems. Um, and so our, our real questions as we work with practitioners and as we work with, with, with folks across the U.S. and elsewhere is, First, you know, how is it that infrastructure is actually vulnerable to extreme weather events? Uh, you know, where are the where are those vulnerabilities? And then, how can uh, we transition infrastructure and the the communities and organizations that are that are part of that infrastructure to more resilient, equitable, and sustainable uh, pathways? Um, and so, these are really a couple of driving questions we've been after now over the past six years uh, through the Urex SRN. Um, and, and here you can just see the cities and, and, and some of the universities uh, that have been involved in that. Um, and I think I just want to talk quickly. I'll, I'll go through what I think are, you know, we'll, we'll, I talked about sets a little bit. That's the socio-technical systems. That's one exciting thing we've been advancing. And we're starting to see that being worked into the way our partners are approaching resilience. Um, I think another important piece here is, is that 
the the idea of of thinking about these complex systems as interlinked sets it is really a reflection of the diversity of the team. And so as we come at these policy and planning issues, it's not just social scientists thinking about the policy issues, nor is it just a bunch of engineers uh, thinking about what they might be able to do to make infrastructure more robust or resilient. Uh, nor is it a bunch of ecologists going off and just trying to uh, understand how ecological systems might be more vulnerable to climate change or how infrastructure might be damaging uh, those ecological systems in some way. But it's really uh, ecologists working with engineers, uh, working with social scientists, um, as well as with policy expert practitioners to really co-define and, and co-produce you know, how we uh, uh, develop our, our broad approaches as well as more specific approaches um, in each of these cities and specific projects. And so I think that's really what's exciting uh, about some of the work we're doing. And I don't have a chance to get too much into it, but I think, you know, as we think about policy impact and, and policy research, uh, that trying to figure out how to bring together uh, these, these teams and not only work together in an interdisciplinary way on the research side, but also work together you know, with community members and with practitioners to understand where the policy windows might be or, or work together so that as things emerge, we can, we can be ready to adapt and adjust and, and, and have an impact. Um, and so then I'll, for, for today though, I'll talk a little bit about um, this idea of, of uh, knowledge systems and governance and, and focus on some of the policy work we've been doing as well as a little bit more about knowledge co-production and how we're working with uh, practitioners. Um, and so, um, so, so quickly, so, so I'll skip that. Um, so I think, you know, when we, when we think about sets and we think about infrastructure and how existing uh, a pro policy and planning uh, and, and governance approaches to infrastructure, much of that is really built on this idea of control, uh, controlling a certain set of flows, whether that be water, whether that be transportation, whether that be electricity, and trying to isolate and control those. Um, and we would argue, and I think we're seeing that in the face of the Anthropocene, in the face of increasing complexity, um, that 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 these organizations are realizing that that the the tight control of these systems is increasingly untenable uh, but the issue is that these infrastructure systems and you can just look at the ones in front of you and on the on the on the slide are materially resistant to change it's not easy to change you know how water gets to the the you know, fifth largest city in the united states of america um, but it, they're also uh, socially resistant in terms of uh, not only in terms of how you change the way organizations understand their mission and the public values they're they're trying to generate, uh, but also uh, in terms of the social expectations and norms and what communities are are willing to do and how they're willing to change. And so th those systems are obdurate; they're resistant to change. And then the second key piece here, I think, is that they're inter interdependent. Um, and so uh, here you just have a picture of the uh, uh, of a station um, uh, during the recent uh, weather in Texas, but. Uh, this is just to say, for example, with the grid failure, you had the, the failure of natural gas supply uh, lines, you had the failure of the actual uh, electricity generation stations, both in terms of, of natural gas uh, fired ones, as well as some in the renewable sector. Uh, but then that led to the failure of local water, water systems. It led to the failure of local public health systems. And it's even impacted the uh, supply and delivery of, of COVID vaccines throughout the country, right? And so you have these interdependent systems um, and our infrastructure governance and our infrastructure organizations are not set up uh, to, to either adapt to that control, to be more flexible from the previous slide, nor are they really set up to deal with this increasing uh, interdependence. And so it's not just a problem of how do you design the physical grid in different ways, it's also a problem of how you design our institutions to adapt to this new world. Um, and more specifically, how you design our knowledge systems. And so this is one of the ideas we've been working on of a knowledge system or network of actors and institutions that generate, validate, share, and use knowledge to advance specific policies, decisions, and actions. Um, and so just as a quick example, so this is, um, these are pictures from New York City in the wake of Superstorm Sandy. Um, and, and you had a lot of uh, discourse, both in, the, in, the po in politics and in media, 
that, you know, we never could have seen this coming. And you see this after almost every extreme event here in the United States. We never could have known this is unprecedented, right? Yet the map that I'm showing on the screen uh, was actually a study done uh, for a technical report uh, for climate adaptation work in New York City um, and shows the subway lines that would be flooded given certain uh, uh, sea levels and given certain strengths of storms. And this happened before Sandy. And these ones that they said would flood did actually flood. And so while you have the, the, um, the transportation authority chairman uh, saying this is worse than the worst case scenario, no, we actually you know, knew what would happen, uh, but that knowledge wasn't used. And this is no surprise for folks that might focus on the use of science and policy, but the best available scientific and technical, technological knowledge is not often used uh, or widely disseminated. And that's not just because of politics, it's also, I think, because of uh, organizational design. And so to bring this down to some of the work we're doing on the ground uh, with communities, and this example is from Portland, Oregon in the Northwest, which is uh, dealing with both flooding and changes in precipitation patterns, as well as extreme heat. Um, you know, one of the issues that they identified early on, uh, and you can see in the top right, was this idea of the design storm. So how, what, what type of uh, rainfall event should their stormwater system be capable of, of handling uh, without flooding both the streets as well as they have a combined both sewer and stormwater system. So then that could put waste out into the local waterways, which then would get them in trouble with our federal environmental protection agency. And they've been in trouble with them in the past. Um, but then they realized that, wait a second, changing the design storm standard, that's the standard storm that the system should be able to handle, even if they knew what the climate was going to be and what they should be able to handle, the way the design storm works is it's, it's a backward looking. You look at historic rainfall patterns and there is no way without changing kind of the way they assess risk and, and, and work with constituencies and can promise the level of service that they can provide. Uh, there was no, you can't just swap the retrospective for a prospective one, essentially. Um, and so it wasn't a problem of needing better knowledge about future climate. They didn't need a better climate model. They actually were like, wait a second, even if we had that information, this is a problem of organizational design. And this happened again and again with issues around transportation, with issues around uh, green infrastructure and ecosystem services. And so they came to us and they were essentially like, let's work together on building a new framework uh, for how we should work together uh, across the, uh, the city bureaus, across regional uh, uh, governing bodies, as well as with communities to think about how we govern urban resilience. And so we've done two things with them. One is we've gone out and looked at how is it that other cities are governing urban resilience? What are urban resilience offices and officers doing? And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go through this right now because I don't wanna uh, grab time from the rest of our conversation. So I'll just, uh, we can always come back to this. Um, but then based on that, we've then designed a series of workshops uh, with, so this is where the co-production comes in, policy and governance co-production, to work together with the practitioners and with the communities uh, in Portland to think about what, you know, how their current organizational and governing structure is in fact a barrier to working across um, uh, bureaus that they need to be working across in order to do uh, urban resilience um, and, and what are some different ways they might think about structuring in the future. Um, and so that's been put on pause a little bit because of COVID, but we're about to get to back together in the next couple of weeks to, to continue to move this work forward. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, I'll, I'll just say some of the, you know, to, to be a little more hopeful, because I feel like that was like the Anthropocene is terrible and everything is bad, uh, but, but what we're trying to really pivot to is how can we work together with practitioners and other researchers um, to think about how uh, to, to design the built infrastructure as well as our uh, institutional infrastructure uh, to, to be more resilient, whether that's things from proactive maintenance to equity uh, and redesigning of institutions and creating more flexible infrastructure. Um, uh, and, and so those are a lot of the issues we're working on now with you know, interdisciplinary scholars as well as uh, with uh, practitioners. So thank you very much. I hope that wasn't too rapid fire and I look forward to Juniper's talk and our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Miller, for this amazing insight. And it was 
it was really very eye opening and especially the examples that we got to see from all around the us it was really really important for us to look at it in this way because the way we've been looking at climate change and resilience is very restrictive in the current scenario so this is this is very like it just you know expanded our horizons of understanding it thank you so much um we'll just check if we have a few questions but i guess we do not, okay yeah we do have one question it says uh, what you believe as most problematic element of this process and do you believe we are moving in a positive way for making cities resilient in present scenario um so that, i mean that yeah that's a great great question and i'll just stick you know one of the things i want to do is look at this and and more comparatively you know looking not just at the us context but elsewhere and i think it you know what you see is that it really varies not just across cities and regions within the us but i think across the globe and i can't speak to as much across the globe so i'll just stick to the to the us context um and i think i'll start with the the second part first the positive way i think you are really seeing in the us there's a lot of cities that you know, in part because of federal inaction in the U.S. context um, on climate, um, but also because of the fact that, you know, cities are seeing the impacts of climate change um, on their local constituencies, on their ability to be, you know, a growing, thriving uh, region on public health. Um, and so I think it, what's encouraging is you're seeing a lot of action on the local level, right? Um, and then the flip side of that, I think the problematic side of that is that, but a lot of this requires more than just action at the local level. And not, I'm, I'll just stick to resilience even, not even talking about mitigation and greenhouse gas reduction, uh, because not all cities have the resources to, to, to you know, advance uh, resilience projects. And, and, you know, quick and easy fixes are trying to, no, not necessarily easy, but cheaper might be to reorganize, you know, create a resilience office or officer. But a lot of these built systems also need to change or additional things need to be built. And that, you know, is a huge capital investment. And, and so I think trying to get additional federal action to work with uh, local regions and cities is, you know, on the practice side, uh, you know, the most problematic element. And so um, the U.S., we like talking about infrastructure, but not really doing anything about it. So we'll see what happens uh, with the, the new administration here. Correct. Thank you so much for answering that. We'll take one other question. Uh, the question is, would you have any comment on what Bill Gates has been prescribing in dealing with climate change? I think we'd you like know, to- No, I, um, I haven't read his book. Uh, right. And so I don't feel comfortable endorsing nor, nor critiquing exactly. uh, that right. yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think uh, we'd move ahead with the next session and then we'd wait for new questions to come up at the end of the entire session. So we now have Professor Jennifer Katz to speak to us about another important issue today, and that is Mortar and Wheels, the role of nonprofits in policy. With her experience in the field, we would know for sure that there's more information coming our way. So we welcome her to just begin her session and enlighten all of us. Thank you, Professor, for being here. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Pollock. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, let me just uh, get things set here. Yeah. So um, I'm so pleased to be here. I think that our two presentations, Professor Miller and mine actually go together a little bit. Um, I wanted to speak for a moment just about why I care about um, natural resource management, about nonprofits and the environment. And um, we were just talking about kind of the urban context. Well, I'm coming at it from a more rural perspective. I was raised in a rural environment um, during a time when there was a lot of conflict in society between people who wanted to um, continue logging natural resources for timber uh, and groups that were trying to protect a bird called the spotted owl. And it was a very big um, and sometimes violent conflict between people who lived in the same communities. From, so from a very young age, I wanted to know, is there a way that we can manage the natural environment that doesn't pit people against each other um, who live in the same community. So that's kind of the origins of my interest in this work. Today, I'm gonna to speak a little bit about a program that I've got some experience with. I researched it for my dissertation and it involves land conservation. Now, some might ask, why do we need to conserve land in a nation that has so much of it? Um, and it's true, there is a lot of land in the United States and a lot of it is open and seemingly um, wild already. Um, but the issue is that 
the land that is the best for things like agriculture and habitat, um, that is often also where people want to live. It's where people want to build more homes and more communities. And so there is this conflict between um, what we should leave open for agriculture and wildlife habitat and ecosystem services and what we should build up for homes and communities. So my plan for today is to talk a bit more about the big picture and then I'm going to introduce a specific research context that um, I did some research for in my dissertation and go over the questions that I posed, a look at the data and a look at some of the findings, there's not time to do it all and briefly discuss why I think it matters and hopefully um, you know, hear from you all about what you're interested in. So why wheels and mortar? Um, in the scholarly literature and even in the applied community, there are competing images of nonprofits role in the policy process in civic society. So one way of looking at it is that nonprofits fill a void that government is not doing. So this is this idea of mortar that, that nonprofit, nonprofit and civic organizations fill these gaps um, in services in, in communities across the country. And there's a long history of volunteerism in the United States, and that is true. Um, there's another perspective that nonprofits are really advocacy organizations. So a nonprofit cares, uh, might come together to promote um, you know, fighting climate change, or they might come together to promote the protection of birds or a wide variety of issues. And both of these perspectives on nonprofits are absolutely valid and true, um, but there's kind of a third view which looks at the role of nonprofits as insiders in the policy process. So in, in many um, policy settings, the government might pass legislation that enables a set of programs, but it might not be the government that is actually implementing those programs. Often it is nonprofit organizations that become kind of the arm of government implementing policy in society. Um, and so what I'm interested in understanding is when a nonprofit is doing that role, um, how, how do they change policy? Are they themselves transformed by that process? So the guiding theme for me is, was really to, to look into what I could learn about nonprofits and policy by examining um, a simple program implementation setting. And I'm gonna speak a little bit about what that setting is. Um, so the context is US land conservation policy. And there's an agency called the Natural Resources Conservation Service or NRCS for short. That agency um, promotes voluntary mechanisms to encourage landowners to adopt better practices for managing the land. And there's a real deep context for why we have voluntary programs rather than mandated programs like we have for things like clean air and clean water. As you might be aware of, the United States has an extremely strong private property rights ethic. And what that means practically is that it's very difficult for the federal government to mandate that individual landowners, farmers and ranchers across the country adopt practices for the improvement of the land. And so what has developed in this country over time um, is a mechanism or a network of voluntary incentives that are usually market-based to try to get people to make improvements to the land, but also to permanently protect their land, which is the program that I'm focusing here. So the case is the Agricultural Land Easements Program. And what this does is it pays private landowners, farmers and ranchers across the country to permanently restrict their property from ever being developed and built on in the future. And so what this does is a landowner gives up the right to subdivide off a portion of their property and sell it to somebody else for a home or for um, a commercial use. Um, and the idea is that by keeping land kind of open and in agricultural use, um, we won't lose these very important open areas um, in, our, in our country. And the government pays 
a, a fee to the landowner for this. Well, it's land trusts, it turns out, who are a type of nonprofit organization that end up actually implementing the program. This here is a picture of a former colleague of mine when I used to do this work. She um, is herself a rancher. She, her family owns uh, land that's right on the border between Arizona and Mexico. She also does this work as a profession. And so she's kind of here as a symbolic representation of who I was looking at when I was studying the implementation of this program, ALE for short. So my unit of analysis for this study, I actually looked at three, three levels. I looked at land owning individuals, I looked at nonprofits, and I also did a text analysis, but today I'm really just gonna focus mostly on the nonprofit organizations and a little bit on the effects of the program on landowners. So the design and implementation of programs like ALE created this new constituency of nonprofits that are dedicated to protecting public funding for private land protection because it also supports their goals, right? But there's more going on here than this idea that nonprofits are dependent on government funding. So there's kind of a stream or a theme in the literature that nonprofits act in self-interested ways, just like um, other groups and, and individuals in society, and that they're really swayed by, so, by, by preserving the sources of funds. But I'm kind of trying to look at it from a broader perspective where the values of these nonprofits are actually interacting in the program setting. So you don't need to, to take these all in, but I, these are some of the research questions that I posed. I'm interested in um, why nonprofits participate in this program, given that there are some costs to participation, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, I, I was interested to know how nonprofits perceive the effects on organizations from participating in implementing this program. I'm also interested in how nonprofits mediate citizens' concern over participating in policy. As I think we've seen um, in many places in the world recently, many citizens are actually very um, distrusting of government. And this has implications not only for democracy and for voting, but also kind of at the level of policy implementation. If people don't trust government, then it's very hard to accomplish the goals to deliver the public value that, um, that we've promised. Um, I'm interested in whether participation in government program affects land trust political activity and policy activity. So I was trying to see if I could connect um, an implementation setting with an organization's influence in the policy cycle. And then finally, I'm interested in how voluntary programs like ALE influence citizen civic behavior, right? It's this idea that we can reify the democratic values that the nation has as a whole all the way down into the context of land conservation. Um, so the data and methods for this project, like I said before, it, it had multiple different pieces, but I'm going to focus mostly on a survey that I administered. It was a national survey of nonprofit land trusts operating uh, in the United States and talk a bit about what I found. Um, so first I wanted to know, why do you participate in this program? I'm asking these nonprofits because um, in the United States, there's increasing pressure not to use taxpayer dollars to fund things like salaries and lights and um, PR campaigns of nonprofit organizations, right? So the practical effect of that is that government programs are saying, hey, land nonprofits, we want you to implement this, but we're not going to pay you to do it, <laughs> right? So it's this tricky situation where organizations want to advance their mission, but they're not really being paid to do it. So what I heard from nonprofits is that um, they participate for instrumental reasons, meaning it helps them raise funds for the purchase of conservation easements on private land, which is their primary goal. But there were also some um, qualitative effects. For example, uh, nonprofits reporting that still receiving government funding actually increases their legitimacy with other funders. Uh, that it increases their legitimacy, kind of broadly speaking, uh, in the community and among beneficiaries. 
um, and it helps them accomplish their land preservation goals. And then I wanted to understand, so, okay, you're participating in the implementation of this program. What are some of the types of impacts? Um, on the positive side, they get money to do projects. They get that status boost that I was just talking about and improve relationships with other agencies. But on the negative side, uh, Land Trust reported that after working as an implementation partner, they actually had a more negative attitude about government than when they went in, which is of course not the, uh, the goal here. They reported uh, very high administrative burdens. And this relates to, you know, we have this balancing act in a democracy between accountability and efficiency. We want government accountability. We also want very efficient government. And the practical effect of that is that transparency and accountability actually requires a lot of administrative um, actions like special types of accounting and reporting, for example. And organizations felt that that administrative burden was really heavy on their shoulders and that they're just not reimbursed for the cost of actually implementing the program. So the citizens are benefiting, the public broadly speaking is benefiting, but the organizations themselves are really not being paid. So they have to go out there and raise funds from private individuals and other sources of grants to pay, to keep the lights on, so to speak. Um, I, was, I wanted to understand what nonprofits think are the outcomes of implementation, right? So it was interesting to me that 40% of the organizations that participated in implementation said that they felt that they had actually changed the provisions of policy through their relationships with government. So for example, um, you know, much policy in the United States is drafted in offices in Washington, DC. But you know, a, a ranch in Colorado or Arizona couldn't be more different and removed from the environments that people in Washington, DC are working in. So what often happens is when you've got these national policies being implemented, nonprofits are in communication with the agencies to, to, to feed back to them what aspects of policy are just not working on the ground in their context. And I was surprised to see that this many, um, it's fewer than half, but still felt that they were actually influencing the, you know, the provisions of policy. About 30% that they said they changed how policy is implemented. So this is a, all about process, right? And government bureaucracy loves process. Um, and so again, organizations to a lesser extent are feeling like they're actually influencing how policy is implemented. And still fewer said that they changed their own priorities. And the reason I asked this question of nonprofits is because in the literature, there's this idea that because nonprofits are dependent on government for grant funding, that government then can influence what those nonprofits care about. And at least in this context, um, that was not so much the case. So then I was also interested, okay, we've got this program, I'm, I'm learning about how nonprofits are experiencing it, but what actually happens on the ground with those beneficiaries, those citizens who are getting paid to protect their, their farms and ranchers? Um, and the nonprofits really develop the relationship with the citizens. And these projects can take one to two years to finish. They're, they are complex, real estate transactions that involve many sources of funding and lots of negotiation. Um, and nonprofits reported that it's their perception that landowners have a greater awareness of the public benefit of their decision to protect their land. Meaning that when landowners first enter this process or this program, they may be doing it for personal reasons. Uh, perhaps they, they're seeing development in their community and they wanna make sure that their land remains a farm or a ranch, or perhaps they just need the money. But that through the program's implementation, they begin to have a wider understanding of the public value of their private decision to protect their land. They also reported that, that landowners voluntarily adopted new conservation practices or improved existing ones on the land. And these are kind of secondary results of the program that is absolutely consistent with the overall goals of the agency and indicates that even when 
the nonprofit is in the implementation seat, um, there's um, ancillary benefits happening. So another topic I wanted to get into was how landowners' attitudes might or might not change as a result of program participation. Um, land trusts, uh, over 60% of land trusts felt that landowners are hesitant to participate in programs originating in the federal government. And that's you know, what I talked about earlier, just that um, deep-seated uh, distrust of federal government, especially among um, agricultural and ranching communities. Um, and I wanted to know what strategies the land trusts use to, to try to overcome the hesitancy that citizens might have to participate. So these are just a few of the strategies. For example, the land trust would say to the landowner, well, yes, the money's coming from the federal government, but it's really, it's we who you, you're going to be interacting with. So if you trust us, everything's going to be fine, right? Um, the land trust also, uh, uh, filled this educational role. As you might imagine, a program like this is, is quite uh, complex and the land trust would really just go through, this is exactly how it works. This is what the implications are. These are the things that you might want to consider. And so they translated the policy into terms um, at the kitchen table, so to speak, that citizens could understand. Um, and sometimes they would take the tough love approach. They would say, well, take it or leave it. There's not really a lot of other sources of funding. Um, and those are the ways that they tried to kind of deal with people's hesitancy to participate. Um, let me see how I'm doing on time. I should probably wrap up here soon. Um, so finally, I'll just briefly talk about the effect of program participation on civic behavior. So what I wanted to understand is this program is focused on land conservation habitat ecosystem service, but I was curious to understand whether the act of participating in this one program had spillover effects in other ways. And 42% reported um, increased civic part participation by landowners after conveying this easement or participating in the program. And one said, I've seen farmers who have sold conservation easements become more engaged in local civic participation, particularly around local land use politics and support for agricultural economic viability. It's just one example of the ways in which program participation is kind of having a broader effect on the community. Um, interestingly, uh, nonprofits also kind of become promoters for other programs that government has because, again, they're serving this kind of educational role. Um, and I'll just briefly, um, this slide I wanted to share with you because I was very interested in understanding, okay, so what is the, pol the policy activity of nonprofits? And all this really says is that um, yes, nonprofits are active in the policy sphere, and the majority of that activity is happening at the local and state level, meaning that nonprofits perceive that they can have the biggest effect um, in that kind of local and state government um, level rather than trying to, you know, hire lobbyists or really influence things at the federal level. Um, Finally, I did some statistical analysis just to, 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 to ascertain whether participation in the program was tied to an index of policy activity. Um, and I find that the most important factor was really the size of the organization, which is really just proxy for, do they have the resources to participate in the policy process? Uh, so to me, why it matters um, is because this shows that nonprofit land trusts do a lot more than just simply implement policy, right? They are actually shaping policy from the inside of the process. And I would argue that the effects are formative in the sense that they're reifying sets of public values in that process. Now, this could be a good thing, or some could argue that nonprofits shouldn't be in such a strong and influential place. That's a debate for another day. Um, attitudes about government, about public values and conservation were influenced, at least in this particular context. Um, so I will wrap up there and I look forward to the discussion and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Professor Katz, for this amazing, insightful session. And I guess we'd now be taking questions. We have a couple of them here. Hmm. 
So we have one question by Abhinavarun. He says, do you believe, it's a Professor Kads, do you believe still more participation is needed by people to make it more successful? Yeah, it's true. The overall impact um, is remains limited. And I think, I think what we're going to have to deal with in this country is the strength of private property rights. They are just such a barrier. And I think that's true for the built infrastructure that Professor Miller was talking about too. It is very difficult for governments to take action to change things at the scale that we are going to need to change things here. So absolutely, yeah. Correct. Um, we have one question, which is for Professor Miller. It says, is climate change totally dependent upon deforestation made by the people? Uh, that is certainly, you know, one of the, the drivers uh, that's putting, uh, you know, more carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, but it's also from, you know, electricity production, uh, transportation, uh, building energy use, um, and, you know, other uh, land management issues around agriculture. Um, uh, so that's just one of the one of the inputs. Correct. Okay. So I think uh, if there are any more questions, we would love to take them and answer. If you have any question for either of our speakers today, we would be answering them. If in case there are no questions, we would proceed to close the session. Uh, okay. Palak, would you mind if I asked a question? Yes, please, definitely, sir. Yeah. So, uh, and I should introduce myself. I'm Al Roberts. I'm director yes, of the School yes. of Public Policy at UMass Amherst. And, and let me just say before I ask my question that um, uh, Sad and Juniper are two new members of our faculty. They, they've just joined the school this year and we're just so tremendously excited to have them uh, with us. And um, for those of you who are listening, who are wondering about what public policy is about, you've got a very good illustration of, of the kinds of things we think about and how we think about them this morning. You can see that um, it's very grounded. It's uh, it's concerned with the way things actually work. Uh, it's action oriented. How do we address pressing problems? And uh, um, and it's very much concerned with thinking about democratic governance. That is, how do we involve communities and the, and the public at large in 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 addressing the big problems we're facing? Um, I guess I had just a, a question. The, India and the United States have uh, many things in common. Uh, two of the things uh, they have in common are this question of figuring out how to address the challenges of climate change and how to improve resilience. Um, uh, the United States is already heavily urbanized. India is urbanizing at just an incredible rate, uh, building up urban infrastructure at just a phenomenal pace. Um, and of course, in both countries, there's big disputes about uh, land use. Uh, Juniper was talking about that in the American context. And of course, we know the, the disputes about agricultural reform and land use uh, in India are a huge issue right now, too. Um, so I guess I was kind of wondering, uh, and, they're, and both countries are federal systems. They're, they're big, diverse federal systems. And so um, I guess my question, which might be a little vague, is what level of government ought to be taking the lead, it, it, this is for both of you, in addressing the policy question that you're particularly interested in? Is this something that happens? And I guess the question is, what's the role of the central government, the federal government, in fixing the kinds of problems you're interested in? And maybe Sad, can I throw it over to you first? Sure, okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, right, the easy way out is it's multiple scales, right? Everybody needs to be involved. And so, you know, we, for example, just in our own work and thinking about who we're working with, we've been focused more on the sort of community urban level, but the next step, and we have some work under review right now is thinking about that at a regional scale, right? And then interconnected regions. And I think obviously, you know, the federal level needs to be involved. And But I think, you know, it's not just about throwing it to the federal level, particularly on resilience. I think it's about, you know, setting certain standard expectations, uh, standards and expectations. Um, so that way, if you're, you know, if you happen to be in a less progressive state or less progressive city, you're not left behind. Um, and I think you're already seeing some sorting out around that with um, uh, climate-based uh, migration happening in the United States already. Um, uh, but I don't know, I lost my train of thought. Um, uh, but, and so, so I think it's, you know, multiple levels need to be involved. For example, you know, with the Texas grid failure, there's nothing that 
the city of Houston could have done just in and of itself to to work on that, right? And so I think it has to be uh, multiple actors at multiple scales um, uh, working together on that. Was there a second part of the question, Al? Uh, no, 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 no. But actually, it, it, if I could just follow up, and I apologize for <laughs> checking, but but so we've had this this uh, debacle in Texas mm -hmm. uh, recently, a power failure, other system failure, following on the power failure. Um, Texas has been over the years very diligent in basically insisting that it was going to run its power system its own way. Yep. Um, but now that the, the system has failed, the federal government, the central government is coming in to help. Um, uh, I guess, what's the rationale for federal? Is there a, a question of basic rights here? Is the federal government intervening because there is some basic interest that American citizens living in Texas have to have protected? Is, I guess, is, to what extent is resilience about protecting fundamental rights of people? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I haven't thought about it in that way. But I think, you know, especially when you see, you know, yeah, the last couple of weeks of Texas, uh, you have to start to think about that. And ditto, I think, with the wildfires out west, right? Um, and, and a lot of that is on federally managed land as well, uh, or starting on federally managed land. Um, so I have not thought about that question. But I think, you know, when you when you look at the recent events this this winter, and then last summer, you have to think about, yeah, to what extent do you have to ensure when you want to change institutional structures or change the way you manage a manage a grid because you want energy independence are you still going to be able to deliver you know some fundamental services or or are you setting yourself up for you know the inability to do that based on the uh, mantle of of uh, free markets great thanks uh, juniper do you want to yeah i mean i think there is there is what is and there is what should be um, and the fact of the matter is our federal legislative bodies are not working right now. So from a practical standpoint, the state and local level is where the action is happening, right? Um, I've done a teeny bit of research uh, on an Indian context looking at fracking, um, which is you know the removal of oil and gas using uh, water injection techniques. Um, one thing about fracking, you know, I find my, my own self going back and forth, right? So in, in some places, fracking in most places is regulated at a hyper local level. And the practical effect of that is that you have oil and gas companies, you know, looking through 30 pages of regulations for the same well pad that might straddle two different jurisdictions. And it creates inefficiencies, it creates hostilities, it creates an anti-government attitude um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, it gives local communities the ability to control fracking activities in their backyards, which is arguably, arguably a, a normative benefit, right? So you get these, these conflicting um, stakeholder interests that complicate um, how, how we run things. And I don't have a clean answer for, for what level it should happen at, but from a practical standpoint, certainly on climate change and resiliency, it's the local communities, the state level government and um, cities that are really taking the lead, at least in this country. Thanks. Over to you, Pamela. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Alistair, for asking this wonderful question because it was really insightful to hear the answers to it. And actually, it opened up new avenues of thinking for us also. So I think it's time to wrap up. We, we are going to thank Professor Thedius. We're going to thank Professor Juniper and Professor Al for being here throughout the session, giving us information about the entire topic of the lecture and making us more and more aware of the current happenings around climate change, around NGOs and their role in policy making. So it was great to have all of you here. And now I wish on behalf of J.K. Lakshmi Perth University and UMass Amherst an enjoyable evening to all of you. And I look forward to hosting all of you for the next session that we have on Sunday, that's tomorrow. So this time we are having two sessions tomorrow also. And they are on very, very important issues again. The first one is very related to, uh, again, climate change. So it's using carbon pricing to achieve an equitable energy transition. And the second one is on controlling corporate power. 
So there are going to be more stellar academicians coming with us from University of Massachusetts Amherst. So till then, stay safe and connected. Thank you to all the professors being here. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.